All right, we want to thank everyone for, again, being here. It, it isn't lost uh, on uh, we, the board, and I think I can say on behalf of the board, um, for folks to be here, recognizing that, that um, you're not paid to be here. So we appreciate you coming. I, I, I also want to share a little bit about the board and, and, and talking with the co-chair. I, I feel like I should have done this in the beginning. Um, just so for some clarity purposes, because we equally are not paid to be here. Um, this board is a voluntary board. I just want to say a couple minutes as we go in to how we got here. All right. So in, in 2014, uh, the, there was, you know, what, what's been called the Ferguson moment across this country, um, which certainly raised a profound um, sense that we had hit an impasse in the relationship between the community and the police that needed to be addressed in a deep, deep manner. Um, I myself was in Ferguson during the time of the uprising, as, as was Uncle Bobby and, and several others that uh, are in the room. In 2015, Assemblymember Shirley Weber, is a sister from San Diego, was thinking about her three sons and she had a conversation with her three sons who told her, mom, you, you and the assembly, but you're not doing anything to be responsive to what's happening in Ferguson. So Shirley Weber put together Assembly Bill 953. And it was a bill put in place to collect data around police officer stops. Because while anecdotally, we in the community who've been impacted by these issues were saying, you know, we cannot trust the police department because of the, the treatment, the experiences that we've been having, but we didn't have any data to make that case. So Shirley Weber, Assemblymember Shirley Weber, passed the bill. When we were trying to pass the bill in 2015, there was not a lot of will in the legislature to pass the bill. Many of us who are advocates, community members, went, tried to pass the bill, and, and there was not a lot of will to do so. On September 2nd, 2015, we led a mass action in Sacramento. We had been having conversations with, with legislators and folks in the governor's office, and for a variety of different reasons, they said, you know, we're not going to be able to pass this bill. It was said to us, uh, it'll take an act of God for us to sign this bill. And so, led by Sister Rosa Cabrera, who was in the room, I don't know where she's at now, she's sitting there in the back. Stand up, Rosa, so people at least can see you and know who she is, all right? <laughs> Sister Rosa Cabrera put together an action that brought a 1,000 people to Sacramento to protest, to be involved in action that led to the passing and the signage of Assembly Bill 953, the law that we are discussing right now about data collection. It was brought to bear by the community. Youth Justice Coalition was a part of that coalition. Pico, California was a part of that coalition. Black Lives Matter was a part of that coalition that brought forth Assembly Bill 953. Now, a part of that law and it being implemented we all asked that there would be the creation of an advisory board because we didn't want to just pass a law, but then ultimately there was no people to successfully implement the law. So we said we wanted there to be an advisory board that would serve for the fourth, first four years of the implementation of that law to ensure that it was appropriately put into place. And so from that position, people were nominated to be on the Ripple board. And so they were nominated for all across the state, representing a, a, a variety of different constituencies that were influenced by the community-based organizations and elected officials. So on this board, you, you know, there's several members that are not present, but on the board you have everything from law enforcement to civil rights attorneys, people who have been fighting for 20, 30 years to, for the civil rights of folks across the state. We have retired judges, we have public defenders. We have folks who've been, who've been advocates, lawyers, fighting in and around immigration, fighting for other kinds of labor rights. We have folks who've been doing civil rights and advocacy work around schools. Um, these are all the folks that are sitting uh, on the board. Our purpose being to implement, successfully implement uh, AB 953. Last 60 seconds I will say on this, and then I wanna, I wanna wrap it so that I don't want what I'm saying to be misunderstood or misheard. 
the the what is the work that we've had to do? The data that had to be collected based upon the bill had to be decided upon. There's also somebody else that's missing out because I was talking to one of the loved ones before who was saying we need to have a, a young person on the board. There is a young person on the board. His name is Timothy Walker. Uh, he came out of COCO in Los Angeles, Community Coalition. Coalition in Los Angeles. He's now a student at San Francisco State University, and he sits on the board. He wasn't able to be here because he's in school. And, and, and so what I want us to know is that the board – um, there still can be very much so some critique around who's not represented on the board. And as somebody that's involved in the movement, I always feel like you got to be low ego and high impact, right? So we always got to be able to hear some critique because things and processes can always be done better. But the, what the work of the board has been has been to decide what are the, um, what's the data that's going to be collected? How do we define what is a stop versus a call of service? How do we define all these things? Because we are creating something that did not exist. And that's the work that's been going on for the last 18 months. The reason that we hold these meetings, somebody was asking me, why are the meetings run the way that they're run? Because this is the implementation of a law. Everything has to happen in the public. So every meeting that we convene on this board, whether it's in small committees or the whole board together, has to happen in the public. And the public has participated and can continue to participate in small committees or the larger room. I want to thank all of the, the folks who are here bringing the story because I, I, I'm, I'm a speak person and I think I'm echoing some of the sentiments of folks on the board that it is the public comment, it is the stories, it is the pain, it is the critique, it is the challenge that I think continues to inform us around how to take very seriously this role that we have to be responsive to the pain and the hurt of the community. What I want to just make sure as I, as I close is what I don't want to be heard by what it is that I'm saying is somehow a, a desire to disappear the, the voices and the stories of what have been heard or to try to explain somehow for the system, you know, what's going on. I just wanted to make sure for folks who are being introduced to the board for the first time, why we exist, who put us here, what the purpose is to accomplish, and then just to continue to celebrate um, that we, we welcome all voices, even, even when uh, the, the framing might be very piercing. Um, what I hear when I hear very piercing critique is, is the reality of pain and the urgency of the moment. And so I just want to thank everyone for being here. We're going to have a secondary public comment. Before that, there's uh, a couple um, pieces of business that we d need to do on the board to talk about the two 2019 report. We're going to answer some of the questions. There was three main questions that I, I think we both recorded, which were uh, both around uh, the board review and data for AB 70, AB 71, uh, the need for uh, open access to the RIPA data that's going to be collected. Um, and there was another question around whether officers are going to have power to edit after the report is inputted. So we'll make sure those questions are answered before we go back to public comment. Um, next, what we're going to be uh, just spending some time is to ensure that this board identifies what is the work that we're going to be working on this year for the themes outside of just collecting the data, but the other themes that we need to be working on uh, as um, a committee. And then we also need to select the new co-chair because uh, Chief Madrano is uh, going to be stepping off the board. Co-chairs only serve for a year term, um, and my year is coming up soon. Amen. And um, and and so, you know, we're all trying to figure out, just, you know, how to how to support and play the role that it is we're playing. So I just wanted folks to hear that. Um, if there's anybody that that feels offended by that or feels like, hey, I'm not feeling what you're saying. I'm going to stick around when we get done. I'm, I'm happy to answer any and all questions uh, and hear critique. If folks feel like, you know, um, I need to hear that, I'm down to hear that. So uh, low ego, high impact, um, we all got to do this thing together. So I'm going to toss it over um, for our continued uh, discussion, maybe around the 2019 annual report. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, so I just want to echo the Reverend's comments. Um, 
uh, to the public. Thank you for holding us accountable. Thank you for sharing your stories. They're so painful for us to hear, so I can't even imagine what you all are going through, and I just really wanted to thank you. And we, as a board, need to be able to handle the piercing nature of it, because this is these are your stories. This is, it's just, I, I'm so sorry for everything you've gone through, and um, thank you for sharing your pain. I, and um, hold us accountable. Um, the, the next thing I was going to say, ask before I go into it, because I am uh, the co-chair along with um, Sheriff Robinson of the Citizens Complaint Committee, the Civilian Complaint Committee. Um, but before I go on to what we want to see with regard to that subcommittee and um, the 2019 report, I just wanted to flag um, maybe for future meetings to have like an interpreter or like headsets, because I think there are people here who are not only monolingual Spanish speaking, but may be more comfortable speaking in Spanish or whatever other language. Um, so just for future, future meetings, I think it would be important to have that. Um, so, the thing that we were thinking about for the C Citizens Complaint Committee um, was developing a model complaint form because in our research um, and, and the surveys that we sent out to, uh, I guess, was it 500 law enforcement? How many was it? How many law enforcement? Uh, 425. 425, yeah. There's a great degree of variability in, in um, complaint forms, a considerable degree, um, and in complaint processes. Um, and what I'm hearing a lot from the community is a mistrust and a distrust of the complaint process. Um, and I think what we want to identify are what are critical elements to include in any model complaint form. And um, I wanted to pose a series of questions to the board, one of which is um, resources that, uh, that we can use as reference as we develop the form, uh, whether that be experts that people are aware of. We want to hear from the community about what they think are mandatory or uh, not mandatory, excuse me. Um, critical elements to any complaint form. Also, uh, ideas for best practices for complaint policies and procedures. Uh, if there are jurisdictions that communities are feeling are doing it right, or, um, are, or if there are, um, you know, if there are things that we want to see and the policies of investigation, uh, witness interviewing, the policies for um, resolution of a complaint, that's something that we want to identify. Um, how, how does the board want to, we also wanted to ask how the board wants to workshop this. Do we want to have stakeholder meetings? Do we want to have public forums on what folks want to see in model complaint uh, procedures? And then, um, yeah, so I wanted to uh, ask, uh, pose that to the board. So what do you guys think about those things? How do you want this process to go? Um, and also, if folks want to weigh in on, on public comment, because as it stands, there is no legislatively mandated mo complaint form for every um, jurisdiction to use. So every each, each local uh, law enforcement agency develops its own complaint policies and procedures. So the idea is to develop a model complaint policy and procedure that can be used as a resource and um, for the community and for the board to give input on. Well, I think uh, that's an excellent idea. What would be ideal for law enforcement agencies is to have is sort of a, a, a guidebook. Um, Many, many years ago, uh, when community policing was first being established, they developed a series of guidebooks for a lot of different things. They were called POP guides, problem-oriented policing guides. And these guides were very, you know, they were short, uh, but they were very, um, they were filled with lots of good information that was easy to implement by uh, organizations so that they didn't have to start from scratch. Uh, you know, we have a variety of sizes in uh, law enforcement agencies in California. There are departments that have divisions that do this, and there are departments that have one person that do this. So if we could develop some sort of guidebook uh, that can take an agency to develop the absolute best practices uh, in this field, with the direction being how to intake a report, how to uh, investigate, how to coordinate and, and respond back to community, how to make the process as transparent as possible, and also because of evolving technology, how you can use body-worn video or other things also to uh, let communities understand the process. Um, I think that is something that is very doable by this board, uh, would not be a big, a heavy lift, and it's also useful. Uh, I, I think if we get, uh, you know, 
produce a report that's 30, 40 pages long and you give it to agencies, it, you need guidebooks. If you don't know what, what, how to improve it, here's a step-by-step -step guide, implement this. I know that in my history of 30 years in law enforcement, there have been many times I use those guidebooks to deal with, because, and it's not just California-centric information. We can draw from other, other states that are doing things really well and incorporate it in our guidebook. Uh, I just want to say, I think it's important to have complaint forms, but I think the public really wants to know is what happens mm -hmm. to the complaint yep. once it's filed. Yep. Is there any accountability? And let's say, if, for instance, if, if there lies a complaint and it's investigated and the results aren't favorable to the person who filed the complaint, I think they want to know why. You know, what, what evidence supports your finding? And I think a lot of times you have, and, and in my practice, I've seen this as substantiated, unsubstantiated, but it's, you know, just conclusions without, without analysis. And I think for the public to have confidence in what we're doing, there should be some analysis. When, that, when a person files a complaint, they just don't want to know it's not just a piece of paper. Yeah. Right. Do we, maybe it would be helpful for the DOJ to talk a little bit about the reporting requirements for complaints um, right now with law enforcement. So, so currently those reporting requirements are governed by the penal code. The penal code specifies that they, they are to required to say sustained, um, unfounded, uh, and so those, there's four criteria, I'm not, and you probably know them better than I, sustained, unfounded. Exonerated, sustained, sustained unfounded, Ex and um, exonerated. exonerated, yeah. I think it's a and, and so um, that may be another avenue for future um, legislation if they want to, if we want to have the categories changed or expanded upon. However, um, AB 953 did provide an opportunity to disaggregate racial um, and identity profiling information, so race, gender, age, that will, that will be reported to us um, by each agency per those specific categories, and then further broken down into those four categories as to whether those complaints were sustained or unfounded, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so that is one piece um, that we hope to also go look, look at in terms of how can we collect that information and provide it back to you um, in a way that, that makes sense. I think that there was some question about investigations that may be opened in one calendar year but then completed in another calendar year, so how are those being counted? And I think that's something that, that it may, the board may want to look into, or it was a proposal in our last report as to kind of changing that. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, with regard to this issue of um, a conclusory statement, i.e., founded, unfounded. Um, I'm not familiar with the legislation, the law you're speaking of, but does that law indicate that you cannot analyze, provide an analysis supporting the conclusion, or does it simply say you have to indicate what the final result was? Because if indeed I can't conceive of a law that says you cannot analyze uh, the right. basis for this conclusion. I, again, I don't, okay. I'm not familiar with this law, but I'd like to know. I think Ed would like to address it, but the, the thing that I was speaking about is just the statistical uh, reporting requirements to the DOJ. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was, I guess I was calling, uh, continuing the discussion that Mr. Oden was making about this. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I understand, and, and Mr. Oden's absolutely right. Um, generally speaking, when, when agencies provide the information of the outcome of the investigation, they provide one of the four dispositions. To be quite honest, if your agency doesn't also define what that means, I mean, what what is what does sustained mean? What is unfound? What does non-sustained mean yeah. compared to sustained? Yeah. There's all these definitions. Most agencies should have a brochure that goes along with that to show and demonstrate to the to the community like this is what that means. But we're also prevented from sharing uh, the details of the investigation other than the details that the complainant already knows and the discipline that was, uh, that, that was given or to the officer and let's say if the case was sustained. Um, 
those are things that are beyond our control with current current law. Um, so if the, the board wants to, um, you know, part of our previews to look at complaint processes is to look at what's the best practice for dealing that to, for communities to understand what what these complaints entail and, and what is more than just a one word definition of this is what happened to your complaint. In many cases, I can understand. It's, it's fairly sterile. You get a letter that says X happened um, with not a lot of detail, so. Yeah, and just the only other requirement in the law other than this data reporting to our office is that agencies have a written procedure yeah. for how they are going to conduct a complaint investigation. It's really like just procedures, and it, it's nothing, there's nothing in the law that specifies um, what those procedures need to entail. Yeah, yeah, and there's a great degree of variability um, from lo law enforcement agency to the next. Some law enforcement agencies um, allow you to file a complaint not at the department, at a library, um, uh, by the internet, by a phone call if you feel uncomfortable going in. Some don't. Um, some agencies have it translated in multiple languages. Some don't. Some agencies appoint an independent investigator. Some don't. Some agencies have civilians uh, look into it. Some don't. So there's so much variability, which just under scores the importance of having a model complaint form. And I know I asked the board, but I actually think it would be a really great idea to have stakeholder meetings and hear from experts and groups um, and agencies that are doing it well and agencies who want help and um, hearing from experts. So I think, I think that would be a good idea if the board is also of the mind. But they would have to be conducted in public. I, I too, I think that's a great idea, yeah. and especially seeing that there's this variability, mm -hmm. and I think it'd be really important for as a board to hear from all kinds of stakeholders. Yeah. You know, people who have you know dealt with the system and trying to get information or filing the complaint, and given as Chief Majana was saying, the variety and sizes of law enforcement agencies to hear from law enforcement too, and does it one size fit all, or should there? You know, are there issues depending on the size of the agency right. where some methods may be more effective than others? Yeah, and just also one thing to add, the way the data is right now, say an agency has a ton of complaints, that might mean that they're doing it right because they have an accessible form or accessible policies, but an agency that reports one, maybe their policies aren't, nobody feels comfortable going to the department or it's not in Spanish, so it's just hard to really do a lot with that data <laughs> given the variability. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, just a, I'm going to comment. First, I want to associate myself with the comments of Mr. Mr. Olden. Do appreciate your commentary. Now, just so that the community and folks watching, so that we're clear, stepping forward, what is the recommendation, and and what's the process by which we will go to ensure that what you're recommending happens? Will we have a hearing? Will the next meeting be a quasi-meeting slash hearing where you'll have professional experts provide testimony, or will it all be done within the committee, committee of the whole? How will we move forward on this? It would be great, I think, if we could do it in, in public and not in the committee meetings. Okay, so I just want to make but sure. I don't know. No, I want to make sure I'm hearing what you're saying. What you're saying is you'd prefer to do it as a committee of the whole, if possible, at the next meeting, take testimony from professional experts. because. You have a great recommendation, but I, I hear a lot of recommendations, and I kind of want to understand exactly what we're going to do leaning forward, and then what action will ensue. Yeah, I don't. I think we just wanted to float it out there right now, but um, I, I, I'm happy. What, what do you? What do folks think? I mean, what is the well, DOJ? One think? of the things is we did a lot of the work in the regulations via. via excuse me. We did. We did. Um, much of the work through committees and then report it out to the board because it could be, you know, it could be rather labor intensive to have yeah. all of these, you know, discussions with all the different yeah. minutia at the board level. Mm -hmm. But certainly the board chair could, you know, have those meetings, host the meetings, they're all public, and then report back with some of the key findings or, or at least things that the, the board should consider to vote on. Well, the subcommittee meetings can be not done, we could do them in public right now yeah, by a yeah, teleconference. Yeah, yeah, so so to be clear, yeah. when the subcommittees meet, exactly. so we have five different subcommittees yeah. of the board. Whenever the subcommittees meet, we have to notice their meetings 10 days in advance, mm -hmm. and we host them at teleconference locations around the state, and they are open to the public. So folks are welcome to come to one of those teleconference locations and participate in the meetings, and that's 
that gives us the opportunity to conduct more tailored, specific Zero. business around the agenda of any of the particular committees. So the complaints committee can really dig deep into complaint policies yeah. and so forth um, during those committee meetings. So probably doing a lot of the stuff mm -hmm. at that level and then bringing it to the full board for discussion at a larger meeting is probably the best. Okay, so tactic. I just want to, again, I want to circle back to Ms. Dorelli's comment. So as far as process and procedure, could the subcommittee not host a, uh, a meeting with respect to the professional experts and they can provide testimony in a setting <coughs> such as this? Or does it have to be done via teleconference? No, people can okay, attend so, in so, person. So then, then can, can the committee host a hearing so where you can invite, because a tremendous amount of the discussion heard this morning centers around complaint and accountability. Mm -hmm. And this is one aspect that directly impacts the citizenry. Listen to what I heard this morning, listen to what you're saying now, and other folks on the board. It would make sense that there would be a hearing so that folks would be in a position yeah. to have a very transparent discussion, professional experts, folks from the academic world, general public providing a commentary. Now, I'm quite confident it will be labor intensive because you'd have to assemble. We don't mind hosting it here in Compton again. But the fact of the matter is, is that I'd rather, we, I'd rather we do the hearing so that people will have an opportunity to let their say, you know, be heard. Are you proposing it within subcommittee or broader board meeting? Well, the committee could entertain, I guess my question to council, it's a bunch of counselors up here, and judges and the whole nine yards, okay? So, so I'm proposing, predicated upon Bagley Keene, can what I'm saying, and I believe what Ms. Dorelli is saying, can that occur within a, a, a committee, a subcommittee meeting, a hearing? Yeah, it could yeah, be I either. It, I think it, it could does. Be either. Um, yeah. The one thing, the reason why we have elected to have subcommittee meetings in different cities is to allow the public to have the opportunity to come in person right. we statewide we only um we only have locations where a board member is present so there in every city there's at least one or two more board members present and the public has the opportunity to then discuss the business with the entire board. So, you know, over the last two years that we've been doing the subcommittee meetings, we've had really good turnout. And, it, and in doing it that way, it, people don't have to pay for travel. Um, they can come and, and join and participate um, in that way. And so I think we've actually reached a broader group of people than to, you know, when, the, when we have a full board meeting, have everyone travel to a particular city. But we could do that if that's something that you would prefer so that everybody was, it was in the same room. But I just wanted to let you know that yeah. that was the benefit of doing the subcommittee meetings in that way. So, so my only concern about the Los Angeles location, <clears throat> which is why we're here with NA community, the Los Angeles location requires you to pay a tremendous amount of money for parking, multiple layers of security, security through the elevator, security to get inside of the, the office, and it doesn't lend itself to being community friendly, especially for folks within the community who might have some concerns as it relates to immigration enforcement, ICE, et cetera. So, so my thing is that, is that, you know, as an elected public official, you know, you don't see anybody around here securing me, right? So my thing is when you have these, some of these meetings, especially the one downtown, it cost. Is a cost to come and provide commentary and address your, your government. So my thing is if we could find a way to utilize a larger setting within Los Angeles, uh, most populous county in the state, I think that might solve uh, my concern, but I would like to open up yeah. the subcommittee meeting so that it would be in a larger setting and there'll be more contextual dialogue from the citizenry. I, I sort of, can I just chime in? I feel like one of the other things I'm hearing though a little bit is um, this desire to have just a, a broader sort of like scope of experts come in and, dis mm -hmm. and 
talk to the board about a variety of the topics that we're focusing on. So we could actually conduct a meeting that was very much centered around bringing in experts on citizen complaints and a variety of different policies, uh, depending on the types of policies the board wants to focus on this year. So we could really hold sort of, as you said, a hearing in that regard, much like I would have like held a legislative hearing, right? Um, where we bring in, we have a, a schedule of experts. We could do something like that if the board wanted that. And we can hold the meeting in any location as long as we have one, but we, um, we don't always have um, that ability. Um, Andrea Guerrero has offered Alliance San Diego for all of the San Diego meetings. Um, and so if anyone has, we're always open to holding them in different places. So that's not an issue. So, so just a... Or were you going to say something? Andrea? No, I was oh, looking so, at you <laughs> to listen. <laughs> so ju just a, a quick call. We need to go through the other yeah. four committees mm -hmm. um, just so at least we can get some updates around that and, and know what things are moving to so we can make sure we, we leave enough time for public comment. Mm -hmm. um, so just wanted to put that, if, if we could transition maybe to our next report out uh, from the committee and, and just give us that update, recognize that we also still need to elect a new co-chair for the board also before we go to public comment. So if we can be brief and concise and informative, that'd be great. Stay in local policies. Yeah, Andrea or Commissioner? State and local policies is next. I have to go take a call. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, in regards to uh, 2019, taking a look ahead of the 2019 report, some recommendations that, that we had was first to uh, take a look at the various policies and specifically uh, look at uh, areas of information that we could get from uh, International Association of Chiefs of Police, uh, the President's uh, Task Force on 21st Century Policing, uh, USDOJ, and the uh, police uh, um, and from PERF. Also, the other thing we want to take a look at is uh, discussion on other policies. Will we take a look at uh, this board having some discussion and put an information report on best practices for, for, for body-worn cameras or and uh, early warning systems? We thought that, uh, Andrea and I thought that was very, very important. And Andrea, did you have any comments on that? Okay. <laughs> and then, uh, the last thing, uh, you know, both committees, the com complaint committee and our committee uh, on policies and procedures, we both did surveys last year at, at the end of the last year, October, and uh, we sent them out to about 425 agencies here in California, and we got about a quarter of, of them responded, about 125, 128. And initially we had talked about maybe taking another dive into that this year, to get those other 300 agencies that didn't respond, uh, and, and they're not required to. But we had some discussion on our subcommittee, uh, Andrea and I, and, and talking with uh, DOJ is that maybe instead of doing that again, we go back and take a deep dive and take a look at the policies from those agencies in that first tier um, that are going to start providing data because the, the bigger agencies, are, uh, you know, they, they have policy, and that would be something that we could dive into and take a look at it, and then out of that, out of those agencies, look and see what was, uh, you know, make recommendations for uh, for best practices. So those are kind of the three things that uh, that uh, we came up with in uh, in our committee, or I should I say subcommittee. Are there Can any I questions know? on the board on that report, Shannon? I'll just elaborate a tiny bit. Um, so what you have in front of you, this outline that should have also been up at the front, um, this is obviously just a discussion document. A lot of these items were outlined in the 2018 report for um, goals that the, that the board hoped to accomplish in the coming years. Um, I think one of the ideas, and this is completely up for board discussion, but one of the ideas had been to table doing a more in-depth survey with law enforcement agencies um, really until the end of this year and then analyze the largest agencies' policies together with their stop data, which will be in the 2020 report. So 2020 will include an analysis of the largest agencies' stop data and could also include an analysis of their policies to then kind of have a comparison of what we're seeing. 
Um, if we were to do that, then we could spend much of this year really focusing on the best practices around a variety of different policies. And this board would then just want to distinguish what policies do you want to focus on this year? So we included just possible pos policy areas to focus on, um, <coughs> stops, searches, bias-free policing, use of force, right? The board could sort of decide what are the top three or four of those to focus on this year. I guess this is a procedural question. Is it possible for the board to uh, be surveyed on those issues uh, in, in light of the Bagley Keene Act and in terms of transparency so that as, as we look at those moving forward, the board can have already provided input prior to the meetings? Yes, as long as the communication is from an individual board member to DOJ staff, right. and not communication amongst board members. Yeah, so none of this, the, none of anything in here is set in stone. The board could decide we want to send out a survey in a week from now, and here's what should go in there, and we could do that, you know? So um, it really is completely up to you. This is mostly just a sort of preliminary discussion document. Any other comments from members of the board? On the uh, um, use of force aspect, I think we should uh, expand uh, the collection of, of data to include every time there's a shooting uh, by a police officer resulting in either death or great bodily injury. Uh, and the number of times a weapon is discharged, and that should be um, one of the subcategories of use of force. Um, and, and, and also included the, the race of the person that was shot. So uh, the, our, our committee is focused on policies. I think you're talking about reporting data. Um, yeah. Yeah, so our our committee is focused on the policies and we actually, I think, have almost all of the, the policies from the first wave organizations or law enforcement agencies. I think there are eight of them, is that right? And I, and I think we successfully uh, were able to get back their policies so we don't need to request them again. We can use them to inform best practices. We can use all of the other things that Commissioner Stanley mentioned to get at best practices. And I just note that, Sahar, you also mentioned looking, really developing that kind of best practices. So there might be a theme across all of our committees in really um, making this the year that we develop the best practice guides for all of the California agencies, uh, that if we were able to do that, pulling from all of the resources that we have locally, nationally, and from the community input, that would be that would be tremendous. I also believe, and I'll have to refer to see just most of that data that was just mentioned is collected under AB 71. Yes. And, and we had a question from the from the audience about how we can look at Absolutely. using that data. So. Most of that is already being collected. It's just us looking at it from a different perspective. Right, it Although it's not under 953, certainly we could look at it. It's public data. So, and the board could decide to include in its analysis this year an analysis of AB 71 data that's within your jurisdiction as well. Okay. okay. I mean, that would be my request. Do you want to make the motion? Um, yeah, I mean, I think in, in response to the question from the public earlier and in, in consistent with what we should be doing, um, I think we want to include the AB 71 uh, data in any report that we put together uh, about use of force. So move the recommendation. Second. Before we do that, could we explain what AB 71 is? Some folks may not know exactly what it is. Can, can, we, can we get a quick DOJ uh, explanation of AB 71? 
Sure, it's exactly what uh, Public Defender Bobrow talked about. There's a fairly new law in California that now requires, it's been in place just a couple years, but requires law enforcement agencies to report whenever they're uh, fire their weapon or use, a, or, or use other force that results in serious injury or death, or if there is a police officer that, that um, is, is, is killed or um, sustains a serious injury. So that's a new data set that's required. All departments are required to report that information to the Department of Justice. It includes some basic demographic information as well, um, in addition to the fact that the, the incident happened. So that information is being reported to DOJ now and being put up on the DOJ website. So I think there are, the motion was to, for this board to include an analysis of that shooting information, um, you know, fi firearm discharges that result in death or serious injury, for this board to include that analysis in its report. Correct. All right, so we have a motion. Uh, it was second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, motion so carries. We will be integrating, paying attention to the data of, uh, of AB 71 to be used in partnership with AB 95. You have a question? Oh, it's not a big thing I did. You want to keep sure that? Well, I just had a quick question. One, one quick question from, from uh, the judge. I just had a quick question with regard to local policies. Are we all in agreement on what we mean by local policies? In other words, would that include, for example, and this may not be the proper phrase, but police deployment practices? I mean, a, a police deployment practice that puts a disproportionate number of officers into black or Latino neighborhoods would be something you'd want to know when you're evaluating the stop data information, particularly insofar as it disproportionately identifies people of color as being stopped. But I don't know if that's included, if that type of uh, policy is included here and how hard it would be to get it. I don't know. Uh, in, in our discussion, that, that, had, that wasn't part of it. Uh, could we do that? That's something we could we could take a look at in, in our subcommittee. You can discuss it. Thank you. All right. I believe we have a couple more to do. The next one is post training and recruitment, and and uh, co-chair uh, uh, Ali and myself. In the sense that I've been taking up more space than what I would like, I'm gonna ask the judge maybe if you could. Uh, speak uh, on my behalf, not on my behalf, but as someone at, that is very much so um, doing work on the post-training and recruitment committee. So if we can get a quick report in from you two, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, as was noted earlier, um, the first year um, produced a report that isn't nearly as let's use the term meaty as we wanted it to. And I've therefore spent a great deal of time, as well as has my uh, fellow subcommittee members, just educating myself uh, with respect to post, because um, training is such an important issue here. Uh, what we've done is have presentations to the subcommittee uh, by post. Moreover, I have had a uh, recent meeting with uh, senior consultants uh, who have been extremely cooperative uh, with respect to training modules. Um, moreover, I think that it's time that we also addressed ourselves to the matter of recruitment. We didn't discuss that at all in our first year. And um, it doesn't get discussed much at all. Training is discussed, but not recruitment. And uh, so I intend to ask the subcommittee chair to um, uh, help me uh, and other subcommittee members to put together um, some uh, work designed to not only educate ourselves, but to come up with some suggestions for not only uh, training, but <coughs> recruitment. I also want training um, to be expanded. Um, and I know that I'm not an expert in this area, but I think it's important that uh, the police be trained beyond um, matters of 
stops, investigations, arrests, uh, use of force. I think that we have to acknowledge that when we talk implied bias, uh, we're usually talking about a very narrow frame. We generally mean, well, this officer has uh, negative feelings about people of color and doesn't quite realize it. It's a, it's a psychological perception that he or she has that he or she may not be completely aware of. Um, assuming that that is the case, I think it's important that we talk about human perceptions. We get out of the um, realm of just the police and policing. I have um, talked to staff about providing to board members some information from sociological researchers who are talking about issues and researching issues of power and the use of power and the disproportionate application of power, not just within the framework of policing, but within the framework of how we human beings behave, particularly when we're given a lot of power. Um, so far, I have identified one um, researcher at the University of California, Berkeley, who's been discussing this. And uh, I've uh, secured um, podcasts from NPR, National Public Radio, um, which uh, has a show called Hidden Brain. And uh, this person brings on researchers onto the program to talk about this kind of thing. I will also be attending academy classes. I want to see how training is done, not just what <coughs> training is provided. I want to see how it's provided. Uh, and I've been invited to go there, to go to classes. And I would want to see if I can um, corral as many board members as I can <laughs> to go with me. Um, I, uh, I wanted to talk to the co-chair also about um, uh, whether or not, I mean, what we should focus, what we sh should suggest to post that they focus on, because there are so many issues that need to be addressed, particularly items, issues like use of force, de-escalation techniques, et cetera. Um, so we're, we're just getting started, um, Mr. Chair. <laughs> and, uh, We'll continue the work. Yes. Yes, I'd like to uh, thank the, the judge for her, <clears throat> her comments. Is, there's a, is there a post representative here? Or several. OK. Mr. Charles. Oh, they were here. OK. Mr. OK, so okay. we'll just catch them at the next meeting. What I did want to add is that I assume the judge is referencing Jack, is it Glazer? Did she talk about Jack Glazer over at Berkeley? Uh, no, Kettner. Yeah, okay. Docker Keltner, uh, okay. who wrote The yeah. Power Paradox. OK. All right, so the question I wanted to ask a post, and actually a statement, then a question. So post, the commission has approved making principled police, policing course part of the basic academy. And I wanted to have them to expound upon that so that the community would understand. What, what, can you expound? Yeah. OK, well, we're going to let the chief expound. But, uh, Mr. Actually, uh, Mr. Evans, who is part of the post, uh, was here earlier. He left. Uh, principal policing is a combination of uh, procedural justice and implicit bias that, the, that actually was started by the Department of Justice and has now been taken over uh, in cooperation with, the, with POST. Uh, the problem is, is that during the first couple classes, very few officers ever received the course. I mean, uh, I mean just a tiny fraction. And, and we're rolling it, uh, POST is rolling out that training statewide uh, to include and have outreach. And Charles Evans, I'm going to put you on the spot to talk about principal policing and how, you, how POST is rolling that out across the state. So the record is clear. The gentleman did not leave. He just, he just stepped to the left. Uh, a, a concise explanation. Can you hear me? Thank you um, <coughs> to the panel uh, and illustrious audience members. Um, Charles Evans, I'm with the Commission on Peace Officer Training and Standards. And uh, since I know it's a bad word in, in, the, in the minds of some, but give me an opportunity. <laughs> and so I, I actually am from Ohio. I went to uh, Bret Hart Junior High School and I graduated from George Washington. So I'm a local person. Um, I was a school teacher in LA City 
for about seven years, a uh, proposal writer and for the LA County Superintendent of Schools Office, used to write grants for accounting, and I was with LAPD for 30 years. Not a boo. And so <laughs> I always, I've always been uh, oriented toward improving the community. That's why I went into this kind of work. Had a, a great opportunity uh, to meet um, Ben. I know Ed, Ed for many, many years. Um, so about since early 2015, we've been working on rolling out the principal policing procedural justice and implicit bias program. We've done pretty well. We trained about 3,500 officers so far. We have about 93 here, 93,000 in uh, California. And so that involved about 300 agencies so far. So what we've been doing recently is we've been rolling out an eight-hour course. Are you familiar with the four tenets of principal policing? We talk about giving, whenever there's an encounter, um, a contact between law enforcement and the citizenry, we want the officers to give you an opportunity to express your voice, ask why did you stop me. We want the officers to exercise decision neutrality, not come in with a lot of biases. We want to develop respect and dignity, and we want to get your trust. That's the whole legitimacy piece. Now, I know that's tough because I grew up in the same community as you. So I came up in that kind of community. So not only have I worn civilian clothing like you, I've worn the uniform too. And so I, I haven't lost sight of who I am. And so what I want to do is um, invite you to an opportunity to uh, attend some of our courses. We've had several panel members attend the course. And Ben, and you can hook this up so that when we give those courses throughout the jurisdiction, we're going to have people heat and affiliations here to invite you in. Well, I've already talked to the Museum of Tolerance so that we can actually have a collaboration there where we can bring in many of you from the community. Because I feel like you, you that's correct. That's true. But in the meantime, I would like to invite you in to attend the courses. We have an eight hour course for the citizen. We have a 16 hour course for the trainer trainers and we have a facilitator assessment workshop. We are. Okay, so that's, that's we're, part of the process. We're get, so we're getting ready. Thank, thank you, Charlie. Okay. That, that's a, that is. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> Mr. Co Chairman, I just, just had a, a, the gentleman made a comment in reference to you use the word implicit bias, sir. Yes, sir. And so just was curious to know if, in fact, there's some discussion you know, in public education that there's a huge movement around implicit and explicit bias with respect to teachers who make judgment calls on students, clearly on some subjective you know, visceral feeling, right? And it impacts a child's life, which is, which is why there's zero suspension in many instances, and, and which is why our school police department has moved away from arresting students because, of course, you place a jacket on a black or brown boy and he's done for life. But I'm just curious to know if there's any discussion around implicit testing as part of training relative to implicit bias and slash stereotyping. Yeah, we actually have um, <clears throat> implicit bias as one of the modules that's in the course. And so we're teaching that now. We've actually, um, we, we're running a, a, a pilot course. It's going to be with the San Bernardino Police Department and Santa Rosa Training Academy, where we've actually integrated eight hours of uh, procedural justice training in those two academies. The objective is to actually infuse that throughout all of our academies, but we're going to run a pilot first to see how it how it's going. Okay, so you're going to run and the implicit, pilot. You're going to run the pilot on implicit on procedural justice, implicit <clears throat> bias, and procedural justice. So we're running a pilot on that course. Implicit bias is one of the modules. Implicit bias is one of the modules within the curriculum. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to run that course. So we'll, we'll pick up the public comment is coming. If folks have questions, if you can just write these questions down, we're coming up. We got to make sure that we give some space. Thank you, uh, Charles, okay. um, yes. for some public comment uh, space. We have a, one last committee that needs to report out, which is the evidence-based research and best practices. Um, and then we will uh, select the next co-chair for the board and they will we'll finish our time with public uh, comment. So if we can have a co-chairs for evidence-based research and best practices, uh, give us an update. Uh, I'm, I'm a co-chair on that. Uh, Professor Everhart, who's not here, is usually the driving force in this committee. I, I mean, what's listed in, I don't know if the public has this document, um, but yeah. what's listed in the um, outline for the reports are what we put together over the last year, and that is to create these repositories for the information that we'll be getting, um, the stop data, the training, the electronic tutorial, 
Um, I think what's what's relevant to the discussion here today is that um, there's go there is a tutorial for the public on how to read stop data reports, and that the public will have access uh, to the information and to the data that we collect. Um, we are partnering with uh, a group at Stanford um, that has collected this data from other police agencies already, um, and. Um, I think that it's pretty self-evident as to what we're, we've these these um, depositories for repositories for uh, information that we've we put together, and so um, I think we're just going to get the data and see how it it plays out. Anybody from the board have additional comments? Okay, hearing none, we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda which is going to be the selection of a new co-chair. Uh, we, we had two members uh, that were uh, put forward by the, the board for selection as co-chair. Uh, one has respectfully declined uh, due to his new responsibilities. That's Mr. Stanley, Commissioner Stanley. And the other uh, member that was um, presented forward is Ms. Guerrero, which I think we're going to go find, who just stepped outside for a second. Um, and at this point, while we're, we're uh, tracking her down, is there any, are there any other nominations for members of the board as the next co-chair? No. Move to close nominations. No members? Okay. <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and move now to uh, close the nominations. And... Uh, well... Being that there's only one Ms. Guerrero, we're going to go ahead and take a vote uh, to uh, affirm you as the next co-chair. Although, can I have a motion to uh, elect? Move the, the recommendation. We have a motion second. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Abstentions? Congratulations. See what happens when you leave the room? Welcome to the team. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so, um, so one invite. Uh, we're going to open back up for public comment before the mad dash to the microphone. Uh, just want to ask us as much as we can to be aware of those who were in line before, so as to ensure. Obviously, I can't organize that. We can't organize that from here. So we're inviting folks to organize themselves in that way so that those who didn't have the opportunity to speak in the first uh, public comment would, would be able to speak. Um, uh, the, the one thing I do want to just flag for folks, in case some people I know have been transitioning in and out, but I wanted folks to catch it when people are asking, well, what's the purpose of this board? It's not, it's not doing anything, and why should the public come to be involved, to do anything? So the, the motion that passed earlier that now will, will leverage the data from AB71 into work of AB953 came because of public comment. And so when we talk about um, the, the, the need to have the public here, this is proof of, of the voice of the public changing the way in which the laws will be applied and ultimately have impact for our people. So I want to thank um, Uncle Bobby and community and others that, that you know, have come in to help us at least make that, that one change that I know we're going to go out of here and, and ensure is that the use of force policies are actually used in the data collection uh, implementation. All right. So we're, we're going we're gonna to ask folks to so th three minutes we're really going to ask folks I'm, I'm going to be doing public comment on this last go round I want to just say to all of our our family relatives and loved ones that are that are in line to provide public comment deeply know that nobody's story can be accurately held in three minutes but because we have to conclude on time, I would hate it if there's folks that are waiting in line who would not be able to get their story in. We have to conclude because it is a public official meeting at a hard time for people to be able to leave. So obviously it is, it is up to us to, um, to regulate how we want to hold that. So I'm just putting that for folks. Uh, so at three minutes, the sign will come up that says time up. Please try to conclude 
uh, I'll, I'll be coming in and ask us to include it is not meant in any way a form of disrespect. We're just trying to get as many voices as possible. Public comment. I just want to uh, briefly read this. It's just a short uh, clip of a article about the officer who, Joseph Matu, that taken the life of our loved one, Shalim. It said the BART police was going to promote the officer that shot a man in January near West Oakland Station, selecting him for a mentor role amidst an investigation onto whether the shooting followed state law and agency policy. But the promotion of Joseph Matu field training announced Monday by BART Chief Police Carlos Roja was put on hold due to questions by the Chronicle asking about it and asking why. So how, how can the police be held accountable or be under investigation and then be promoted? Right. Such a mess. Thank no you. Justice. Such a mess. No Thank you. So th this body doesn't have any impact on on what's happening in the in investigation of of uh, of our dear brother who was lost. I'm also in Oakland and and. Um, and we're grieving with the family. We don't have any, any answers or, or impact around that. Um, I believe on the Department of Justice website, there is a space for folks to make some formal questions around process, around what the board could do around some of that. And if folks could direct some of that stuff there, then that'll help it go on record. And then we'll make sure that at least somebody follows up with either appropriate sense of what the Department of Justice can say or cannot say. Obviously, none of us are representing the Department of Justice, won't work for the Department of Justice. Um, so, just holding that. Public comment. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es América Vidal. Soy AICO. Estoy aquí apoyando a la comunidad afroamericana. La policía me detuvo a mi hermana y a mí. Íbamos en el carro. No supe la razón. Y no entendí porque no hablaba, yo hablo inglés, no hablo inglés. Lo que no sabía el policía es que mi hermana hablaba inglés. Um, y su conversación fue echar un volado de qué me iban a dar el ticket, ya que no tenían idea de qué escribir. Solo decían, pues ponle que se pasó la luz roja o que no, que pasó la doble línea amarilla. Y sin efecto me dieron el, el ticket. Mi pregunta es, si hubiera sido blanca en vez de latina, ¿me hubieran dado, me hubieran detenido, parado? No, no lo creo. Como siendo, como siendo Long Beach la ciudad con las vivien, la, la comunidad, más de la mitad uh, hispana, latina, no tenemos un servicio de nuestro idioma, no solo yo, sino todas las demás comunidades. Um, Andrea, ahora Andrea. vivo con miedo por cual, porque la policía me puede detener y puede tener contacto con ICE. Hace unos días la policía hizo una recomendación a la ciudad de Lombis por no Ciudad Santuario. Aquí estoy en cada, cada día pidiendo a Dios que por la policía no me mire en mi etnia y no me detenga para no temer por la posible deportación. Vengo a pedir transparencia y honestidad a la policía de Long Beach. Gracias por atender. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is America Vidal. I am a member of ICO and I'm here also in solidarity with our black community. The police detained me and my sister. My sister was with me. I didn't know why. I didn't understand English. Um, what the police didn't know it was that my sister did, knew, uh, did understand English. And they were going back and forth because they didn't have any idea or what to write in the ticket because we hadn't done anything wrong. Um, they put that, they didn't know whether or not to put in the ticket that I had cross in yellow or in red. And they actually gave her a ticket even though she didn't do anything. <coughs> her question is, will they have stopped me if I were white? No. 
instead of Latina? I don't think so. No, in Long Beach Police Department, um, where our city has a population of more, more than half that are Latinos, how is that they provide a service that is not in our own language? Now, I live under fear because the for the police to detain me because they also can handle me to immigration. Few days ago, Long Beach poli police was recommending the city to not become a sanctuary city. And every day now, I ask God to the pol so the police won't see me because of my etnia, so they won't detain me, so I, I won't have to fear for my possible deportation. I am here asking for transparency and honesty from the police department of Long Beach. Thank you very much. Thank you. My three minutes start when I start talking. Okay. Okay, hold on. Well, number one, I want to say I thank you for being here today. And, um, I'm going to read you the scripture, and it's uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 11, and it states, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. So with that, I want to say to the department, I mean to the Board of um, Accountability for Identity and Racial Profiling, my son was racial profiled on August the 16th, 2016. He was assassinated by Officer David Wells of the Stockton Police Department. With that, I want to say that he is a father that loved his children <coughs> and was raising his children in a proper way. At graduation, <laughs> just as my husband and I supported them when they were young. We took them everywhere, we did everything, but that's not important today because it's bigger than this. It's bigger than Kobe Friday. It's bigger than him. I want the police to be held accountable. Accountable for their ter terrorism, accountable for their police misconduct, a terrible for their widespread assassinations. <laughs> they assassinate the people, terrorize them, bully them in this community, in our country, and it's not right. Although it's illegal, it can, it, they can still be performed as under the blue code of law, just them, not just us. And what about in God we trust? So my stand today is, can we have a ceasefire throughout the whole state of California, throughout the whole country, throughout every, every city, every state within the United States, that they put their guns down, that they use other alternate um, methods of detaining or apprehending a suspect. And with that, I also want to say the body camera is inaccurate. The body camera is inaccurate. We have asked for body coverage release. Just, we have asked for body coverage release since my son was assassinated. August the 16th, 2016, Kobe Friday. And the only other thing, 
that I want to say is that police violence, police brutality, police bullying, bullying is just not fair in our community. It's not fair in any community that we should be afraid and run or hide or anything from the ones that are at a, held at a higher accountability standard to serve and protect our, our communities. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I have one more thing to say. I only stand here today because I was embraced by Dion, Laura, Aaron, and Pastor Smith, Elder Tony, Pastor McBride. I was embraced by people that took me under their wing so I wouldn't be at home right now in a state of total depression about losing my son. So I just stand here today to say, hold them accountable. If we're held accountable for breaking the law, why shouldn't they? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next comment. My name is Dion Smith Downs. My son's name is James Rivera, who was shot and killed by two Stockton police and the sheriff. My son was assassinated, knocked into two mailboxes, into a car, in a garage, and they were shot multiple times. In a My son was shot 48 times and 18 into his body. And you know what the system did to me? They put the dogs on me. Then they filed bankrupt because they didn't have to answer to me. But you know what? I'm here. Eight years later, I'm here standing for justice, not just for James. Because it's bigger than James. And I want people to know I stand to give us hope. That's why I stand on the front line to let them know that you're not going to take our spirit. You're not going to take my hope. And I want to tell y'all this. Y'all got this panel sitting up here. What do justice look like now? Can y'all tell me what justice look like? Because I don't know what it look like. I just buried my brother this month. I just buried my brother this month. And you know what? I had a proposition. The city wanted to settle. But I can't focus on what the settlement right now because I lost my family. I lost my son in 2009. I mean, 10. I lost my mama 2014. I lost my brother 2016. And I just lost my other brother in 2018. But guess what? Y'all didn't take my spirit because I'm still going to fight. I normally walk around, everybody pretty much know me. I walk around with graphic pictures which showed the world what had happened in Stockton. I walk around with a picture with a bullet in my son's head. I walk around with a bullet in my son's neck. I show the pictures of my son's body being, you can't even imagine. And you, we come here, and we talk, and y'all just look at us. When is the changes really going to stand five years from now when someone else stand up here? It got to stop now. I hope y'all have a conscience. I hope y'all have a conscience. Because you know what? It's hard out here to challenge the system that don't give a damn about us. Y'all don't give about us. And I'm going to tell you one more thing. I DA in Stockton, and they told me I was tortured. And it hurt when I heard that. But you know what? They couldn't tell me something that I already knew. I already knew that I was tortured. My kids, my son was three years old. He was three years old. Now my son is 11. Only thing he know, his mama fighting for justice. My kids been picked at at school because they see their mama standing on the corner saying no justice, no peace. So it's bigger than what's going on with me. My children, my children's in an uproar. Do y'all give us counseling? Do y'all see us? We all right? No. No. Did they send the stuff out? Do you digest of what justified? 
Did you give me a paperwork or what are you adjusting for? But you know what? I just got some paperwork stated about my son. It took them eight years to tell me something that I already knew. And it was bull crap because I knew my son wasn't coming out of no garage. And I had to hear that and see that. And it hurt that to tell y'all that it was something that's wrong. Now you want to talk to me. I shouldn't even have to be standing up here telling y'all what do justice look like. Because if you do your damn job, the next family wouldn't have been here. Thank you. Good evening, Ripper Board. I just want to, I'm Joey Williams. I'm the chapter director of uh, Faith in the Valley Kern, also with the Pico California Network. I um, drove over from a place we call Calabama. It's the place where Alabama and Cali California intersect in Kern County, where the Guardian UK identified us as the place with America's deadliest police. I stand here today to represent families who couldn't be here. 84 killed since 1998 in Kern County by law enforcement, Kern County Sheriff's and the Bakersfield Police Department, the James De La Rosa family, the Jorge Ramirez family, the David Silva family, the Francisco Villarreal family, Jason Alderman family, and last but not least, the Francisco Cerna family, who was a 73-year-old man who was gunned down by Bakersfield Police Department for holding a crucifix. Not a cell phone, but we stand here in solidarity with Stephen Clark as well. These are the names. Francisco Cerna's uh, murder by Bakersfield Police burned the California Department of Justice, Camilla Harris, to open an investigation into the Bakersfield Police Department. I want to thank you very much, Angela, for that, for making that connection. But we need right now is we need more than tough talk from, Assembly, uh, from uh, Attorney General Becerra yeah. on police accountability. He's talking bold against Trump and immigration. We like that. But we need to see more action now. Just recently, a family in Delano, where Sahar Durali is from, they were, they were chased down by ICE agents into a ditch and killed, hunting down like animals. This current investigation is investigating departments that have not been forthright. Officer-involved killings, corruption, Demacio Diaz at the highest levels, running drugs with the cartel. Hiring, as we heard today from the Compton Council, uh, from the Compton trustee, 85% of the Bakersfield Police Department is white, when 67% of our county is Latino. I guess my questions are specifically around our heat framework on hiring, equipment, accountability, and training. If we could have the best training, we could have the best programs without accountability, it's not worth nothing. We heard the countless mothers say today, Justice would be our love, their loved one standing before a judge. Yes. You won't give us justice, but we're going to get accountability and transparency, goddammit. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess my questions, how can community members file complaints? Many in Kern who are afraid, as I mentioned, ice hunting down people like animals. How can they file complaints with the same departments that beat and kill them? Is there a counter app that Californians could send to the counter, California Department of Justice on stops and complaints to counter the very one that you guys have sent that they could send, where they could say, hey, here's a place where you could send your side of the story? Can officers just avoid sending these reports due to emergency situations? What is the accountability piece and the sanctions for that as well? So those are my questions I posed to the board today from Kern County and the hundreds of people that we represent, uh, the hundreds of families and congregations. Thank you for your time. God bless Thank you. Thank you. As our, as our next speaker comes up, we're recording some of the new questions. What we'll do is we'll organize them into the appropriate subcommittees and ensure that they're brought up at the subcommittees, which will still be open in public so that folks could get those answers in those spaces and then equally still have an opportunity to continue to ask more questions to get questions answered. But in the sense of making sure we make space for um, more public comment, we have about 10 minutes left for public comment before we take the last two minutes to formally conclude. So 10, 10 to 11 minutes, you have up to three minutes. Obviously, that's probably about three people unless others want to share their time. Hi, everybody. My name is Ellie, and I'm with the Youth Justice Coalition. I just want to ask everybody in the audience, if you are here because you lost someone or a family or a loved one, 
Can you please raise your hand? I want to ask for everybody for a moment of silence for all the families that are here and all the families that weren't able to come here today. You got to talk to the people in line. I can't do it. I just want to share that, quite frankly, I'm angry. I'm angry because my cousin, Junior, he was 14 when he was killed by Santana Police Department in 2012. I'm angry because this is where he's at right now. This is a picture of his grave. He should be here. I shouldn't have had to share his story for him because this should not have happened. All these families, their loved ones, their family members should not have been killed. This sign, I made this sign about a year ago at the Black Lives Matter protest when Fernando Castillo and El Alton Sterling were killed. And this sign, how is it that I still have to carry this sign? Why is it that we still have to ask these officers not to shoot? Why do we, why are we up here demanding something that should have been should already be, should have already be addressed. These families, they drove out here from the Bay, from Oakland, from all these different areas because we want the same thing. We want justice. Time and time again, all these families, all I kept hearing is that they had to do all the work. Once their loved one is killed, they have to do all the work. They have to request the DA reports. They have to go look at the autopsy, all of this. Not only did they lose a loved one, but they also have to they also have to do all the work and nobody is catering to all the families so i want to thank each and every one of you for coming out here and supporting everybody hey y'all uh, my name is Joaquin i'm from you just coalition i'm going to share a real quick song it's something about like a good 5 seconds where do we go from here? Where do we go? So we all know where we want to go when we sit down in this audience. But y'all sitting on the stage, y'all really know where y'all want to go? Would y'all want to take this? Would y'all just sit back and let's listen to our stories and see what's going on today and not take an action? Or will you get your asses up and do what the fuck you have to do today? Or will you just sit back and let another 865 people of color die on the streets to be killed. We all know this, y'all know the school of the jail track, but it's really called the school to, to death pipeline. It always starts in the schools. My peers and the youngsters that leave right behind us, being discriminated and criminalized in the classroom, the educational bully, which leads to, push, which leads to pushing us out. Because the only resources they can provide is they want to kick us out or have a forcefully youth dropout. Now our youth are on the streets because of the educational system. Can't provide us with the resources that need to be happening within those schools right now. Now the law enforcement has an even greater, greater reason to harass us. Right. <clears throat> because of the push out of our schools, which causes them to be but caused them that to be law enforcement bullies now. Fucking them with us, telling us that we're the real problem. The youth. That we fuck up the system. We really it's them. That we're, that they're really supposed to process, but the video's down. Literally deaf every time. With 311 people shot, two tased to death, and one physically beaten. What the f you, you, you say you hear us. Yeah. You say our voices matter. That really youth voices matter. But really, you only have one youth voice on this goddamn board. Compared to 25 people. That's 24 to one youth. Does that even make sense? Really, it should only be 24 youth and one elderly. Because that we're on the streets, we know what the bullies and the ice 
the bullies of ICE and law enforcement have to do with us. I'm going to end it right here. It's just to let you know. You are going to step up your game on better responsibility and representation of youth within, of, of color within the actual system. And on this board, and comments what the fuck you have to do within the next year. Or just get the fuck out the way and let the youth handle it. Because right. right. I don't got time for your fake ass promises. Good afternoon. My name is Rosie de la Trinidad. I am the widow of Jose de la Trinidad and the mother of his two beautiful daughters. Jose was a dedicated and loving husband and father. He worked two jobs to protect and maintain his family. He worked at the pharmacy and Costco and for the city of Santa Monica. He deserved to be here with me and his girls. He was the pillar of our lives. And we will, re we will live the rest of our lives grieving the precious life that was stolen from us. <laughs> Five years ago, our family drove to Compton from our home in Culver City to attend our niece's quinceanera in this city. Until that day, this was our first and only time visiting Compton. Since then, I have been back numerous times to visit, mourn, rally, march, and cry at the spot where he was killed. My husband left the quinceanera with us. We rode in two different cars. He rode with his brother. He was pulled over for a routine traffic stop and somehow ended up being shot seven times in the back as he stood with his hands on his head. He was innocent, unarmed, no crime was committed, wasn't on parole or probation. We, I made it home and he didn't make it. I went back to the party to see what happened. And I learned then that his sister had been taken into custody by the sheriffs. Why? Because they wanted to interrogate her and find out why, what was his business in Compton and asking what his gang ties were or, or anything like that. <clears throat> they held her there all night till the next day. We didn't know. I went to the sheriff's station to ask what, where my husband was, what was going on. They said there might have been a crash. I went to the site of the crash. I got no answers from any of the sheriffs. Once they found out I was the wife, they refused to speak to me. <laughs> I found out the next day on the news. <clears throat> there was a witness who witnessed him be murdered. She came out publicly to the LA Times and said that the man was shot for no reason. He stood there for about two seconds with his hands on his head before deputies unloaded their guns on him. Since then, I learned that she had been, her mother was an immigrant with five children, the oldest daughter was also traumatized by what she saw. They began to park in front of her house, intimidate her, use their scare tactics to, you know, get her to not speak anymore. She eventually moved. I'm sorry. <laughs> After he was killed, we went to the victims of crime to ask for counseling for my daughters and myself. We were denied that because although no crime was committed by him, he was called a suspect. And until those proceedings could, you know, clear that he wasn't guilty of any crime, that we were, we were not allowed any service for therapy, any service for anything. We eventually took our case to civil court, not because we want money. No family ever wants money. But we, we never got an indictment from district attorney. What we got was a hollow victory in civil court. It leaves you feeling so empty. This pain is a pain that never ends. Trauma that we will never heal from because there is no justice. There is no closure when the men who are supposed to protect and serve the community get away with killing your loved one. We relive Jose's murder every rally, every hearing, every holiday, every birthday. I've been left with raising these two innocent girls whose lives have been shattered by the traumatic murder of their dad at the hands of the people they are taught to grow up going to for help when they need help. The good guys, their dad was killed by the good guys and nothing was done about it. 
How are they supposed to go to law enforcement to respect them when they're in danger? If, the, if they killed their father and nothing was ever done, no accountability, not even an apology. He had the right to watch them grow. He had the right to take them to their first day of school, their graduations, their cheer practice, to, to see them off to prom, to walk them down the aisle, to follow them in their careers and walk through life with them as a pillar. Instead, I take my girls to where he was gunned down, to the cemetery. Just like hundreds of other families in Los Angeles and thousands of other families across the nation. There's just been so many more since this happened. And this is five years ago. The pain never goes away. If you are the people that can do something about it, or at least, you know, please use your power and do the right thing. Don't turn a blind eye to the pain we suffer here. Thank you. Um, so that is going to have to be our final comment for today because we have to dismiss at 2.30 because it's a public meeting. Here's, so here's what we want to offer folks because we know there are still things that want to be said and different comments. So what, what I'm going to be, um, so first we want to we wanna apologize to folks that are in, in line. I, I hear you good, brother. You can make a motion to extend the time for public right. comment. I mean, this the Brown Act says that you're, you're allowed to, to, to hear people's comments. I mean, I don't know why you don't just add 20 minutes. It, it, we're not taking any of your time that you don't already owe to us. So can, can, I, can, I, can I answer your question? So the, the reason that question. would not, would, this is not an actual elected board. So folks have to leave at a hard stop of 2.30, and we have to have a certain amount of people here in order to have a public quorum. So it's, it's the, the necessity that there are people that have to leave, and we, do, we will not have a public quorum. We, according to the law, can't hold the meeting unless there's a certain amount of people here. So I don't want you to feel like there's somehow I'm, I'm trying to skirt the law. I just want to give you the clear understanding as to why it is that, that we can't hold on. Here's what we will put in front of folks before final comment. We know there might be some, some folks that feel like, hey, this meeting should happen differently. We should be you know, using the time differently. What I, wanna, what I wanna invite folks to do is send us an email. You can send it to my personal email, ben at picocalifornia.org. I'll leave some cards up here on the front. If we, this is, supposed to be and is a public process. And so we want to take in that input. So if folks are saying, hey, let's use the time differently. We've got some different thoughts about that. Then that will help us in constructing the agenda for next time. So, so it's been at PicoCalifornia.org. I'm going to, they can also email the, and, and Shannon's contact is on uh, the page. Uh, give the, you can send those questions. So give the final Justice. final remark now. to Madrano. Shut it down. Shut it down. Justice. Now. Shut it down. Shut it down. Okay, thank you. Justice. Now. Shut it down. Thank you. Uh, just for the fellow board members. For the fellow board members, as many of you know, this is my last meeting. Uh, I do want to do two things. One, I want to introduce my replacement, Chief Dave Swing, who will be replacing me on the RIPA board. And the last thing I want to say, it has been a real pleasure working with all of you. I know that all of you are committed to seeing the implementation of AB 953, and it's been really, truly my honor to work with all of you, so thank you. All right, this meeting is officially adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Safe travels on your way home.